Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's uh, Trust and Atira lecture. Um, I'm thrilled to be joined by Margot Shea. Margot is Associate Professor of History at Salem State University in, the, in Massachusetts in the USA. Uh, she's author of the book, Derry City, Memory and Political Struggles in Northern Ireland. And it's a book which explores, I suppose, the establishment of the border uh, in Ireland and how the nationalist community, particularly in, Jer in Derry City, grappled with their cultural identity for civil rights and for representation. So, Margot, you're very, very welcome to Trash and the Great to have you. Thanks a million, Liam, and thanks to everybody who's tuned in. I just got to say, um, this is a fantastic series. Lockdown is really challenging. Um, and, whoops, hold on. Technical difficulties from the start. Ah. Oops. Hold on a second, folks. I apologize for the technical delay. I can't seem to get out of the... Let's see. Here we go. Not everybody can go vegan and do a little bit of a little bit of diddly D and get 82,000 followers on Insta. So I can just say for myself that it's been great to learn some history and it's been really wonderful to hear from so many different voices as part of the um, Trasnatera lecture series and the partnership with the Limavati Arts Council. Um, I do know that Liverpool is playing right now. So if some of you are toggling between screens, that's absolutely fine. And um, this probably will play on Facebook Live. And um, if you, if the game gets, if the match gets really exciting. Um, so for some reason, today we're headed to Derry. Um, they say that you should write the book that you would want to read. As someone who came to Derry for the first time in the months following the, the signing of the Belfast Agreement, um, my efforts to learn about the city, about the different histories inscribed on its walls uh, and lived in its streets, led me to what I would consider to be um, a chronological unevenness. I could learn about Calm Kill and the Oak Groves and the Temple Moor, and then someone would hit fast forward. And I would learn about Plantation and the London Livery Companies and the Siege and Governor Walker and Lundy the Traitor. And then there was another fast forward, Civil Rights, Duke Street, the Battle of the Bogside, Bloody Sunday, and the Troubles. The thing that seemed to come up over and over and over in all of this unevenness was kind of the fact of Derry's self-consciousness in its relation to its own past, to its own history. Um, was it the people's consciousness of the past and its inheritances that shaped the sense of place? Or rather, did the place gather experiences and histories and then hold them? Um, either way, every generation since before 1900 and probably even before that, I think Thackeray might have had something to say about this. In fact, the sense of history, uh, of Derry's historicity has been remarked upon. In 1913, it was just kind of a straight up insult. By 1940, there's a mystery, right? A sense of uh, je ne sais quoi. When Sean O'Fallon said, there is something about the city, clustered life into articulate and significant relationships. It was this atmosphere of history and people adopted a certain kind of position, almost a pose, appropriate to the dramatic meaning of their own kind of life. And this had gone into the very stones of the town. 
By 1968, when journalists began coming to Derry, this historicity, this sense of the past living in the city sounds a little bit like a diagnosis. Here you've got a journalist coming to Derry, writing for the New York Times, um, just in the aftermath of Duke Street in 68. Um, and he sort of says the problems that are facing Derry City, London Derry, um, are exacerbated by this relationship with the past. By 1994, Brian Keenan is beginning to introduce us to the both and kind of understanding of history, to the ways in which history and memory are a song or a dance, and they're always in conversation with one another. So here, Keenan also points out the fact that for Derry residents, for London Derry residents, this kind of relationship with the um, is one thing that everybody shares, right? They share it differently and it means different things. Uh, but here you begin to see in Keenan's voice that memory itself, that historicity might actually be a path forward, might be a way out of problems, of troubles. So when I started this project, I kind of thought about it from a different, you know, from a few different angles. Um, and as the project evolved, I asked different questions and I looked to the sources that I was engaging um, through different lenses. So one, of course, is kind of this obvious one. How do you understand a city that has different histories, contradicting, contesting, contestable histories written on it? Um, as I explored that, sort of came to the conclusion that for Derry's Catholic residents, overwhelmed nationalist, um, seeing themselves as Irish uh, in terms of their cultural identity, um, for a long parts of their history, they didn't have the traditional means of expressing political, social, economic priorities in public spaces through formal means. So I became very interested in how people without those traditional means available to them um, sort of seek out their own ability to have a voice, to carry a voice, and to preserve a voice. Um, and I finally, I think that led me to this larger question of what was it like to understand oneself as Irish in the new Northern Ireland? And how did nationalists grapple with what I would consider to be a fairly strong sense of dissonance? So I think that, you know, we sort of roll our eyes, yawn a little bit, maybe bristle even at this idea um, of nationalism. And I, I, can, I can just kind of hear you rolling your eyes through your muted microphones. Um, I get it, right? I'm one of six children and my siblings and I have lived in nine nations. Two of us are married to people who have different passports than we do. Um, try traveling with my family, don't do that. Um, I get it, national identity is simply not the same kind of marker of who we are and where our values lie or how we understand ourselves. You know, um, it's, it's different than it was 100 or 150 years ago. But I think the quote on the screen here um, by George Bernard Shaw, national- I, I, sorry, sorry, Margot, just to let you know that your uh, presentation is still on the first slide. Oh no, yeah. people. <laughs> I, was thinking right, you were, you... I was thinking you were flicking on seriously, but I, I said no, maybe- Now what do you see? No, we're still seeing the first slide. Oh no. I wonder why. <sighs> it's my hubris for telling Liam that I was an old hand. In in Zoom presentations, <laughs> I swear. Um, so. Let's see. Let's try again. Yeah. 
Any joy? No, I think you might need to unshare and then reshare. That that might help. Is that your uh, expert advice? Should I turn off the computer and then turn it <laughs> off again? <laughs> that would be, that'd be Margo. <laughs> oh, goodness gracious. I was expecting my husband to come rushing in to save the day, but apparently he's watching Liverpool. Yeah, we can see that back up again. That's great. What do you see now? Yeah, and it's moved on to the next one now. That's brilliant. It has. Okay, now you know what I'm talking. I was talking about. No, you, it was it was brilliant for that, even without the with, without the slides. You're doing great. <laughs> All right, so now you're seeing Sig and stuff with vegan porig. Yeah. Okay. So write the book you want to read. Here's the you know, the straight up insult. Everybody in Derry lives in the past. Here we've got that sense of mystery, Sean O'Fallon. Um, you know, the sense of place being completely shaped by um, historical sensibilities and a relationship with the past and living, um, maybe not in the past as our, uh, lovely reporter said in 1913, but certainly in a kind of dance with the past. Um, here, do people see, Liam, can you just confirm that we're seeing the 1968? Yep, we are, absolutely. Great, Thanks, okay. uh, So here we are, apologies everyone. Um, this is kind of a, a sense of, of a relationship with the past as a diagnosis. Um, certainly, again, it's a problem, but by the mid 1990s with Brian Keenan's um, idea here that heritage and the awareness of one's past, the awareness of the history that is shared, um, kind of it becomes a means of coming together, even when the histories themselves are parallel, are contested, um, have historically been sort of understood as deeply problematic. Um, so, well, this we'll get into, so we don't need to say too much about that. This is where we were at. And I wanted to kind of share a story. A friend of mine, Elizabeth, um, was from Waterford and she'd recently seen the television series that's been running over here in the States on Netflix, Dairy Girls. Uh, and she said, you know, I was just so surprised. You take out the sort of, um, some of the allusions to the troubles and it, it could have been Waterford. And I was like, yeah, and? But, but somehow it was, it, it's still news to people. It still has to be explained um, that in so many ways, um, Catholic Dairy, Nationalist Dairy, uh, is an Irish city and, and was an Irish city. Um, even in these years where we don't tend to kind of think about that or consider that and we don't have the cultural productions and the cultural representations that might tell us that. So as I was talking about this kind of idea of nationalism and certainly the ways in which globalization, um, both in terms of economics and politics, have really changed our relationship with the whole idea of the nation um, and fractures within nations, certainly the United States is a really good example of this, have also weakened the idea of a national identity being a really clearly defining identity. Uh, in the 1800s and the early 1900s, the case was that nationalism really did matter, at least as Ber George Bernard Shaw says here, it sort of matters in the breach right? It matters in the absence. Shaw was a critic of a kind of overtly romantic nationalist um, identity or philosophy, and he says that nationalism stood between Ireland and the light of the world. But he also kind of made some space for the fact that a problematic and a problematized 
and a sort of a, a brittle nationalism, a contested nationalism, a nationalism denied would certainly create a kind of obsession and interest, a focus, a returning again and again and again to this idea of the nation to help people understand who they are. Right, so he says a healthy nation is as unconscious of its nationality as a healthy man of his, is of its bones. But if you break a nation's nationality, it will think of nothing else but getting it set again. I started out looking to tell a cultural history of 20th century dairy, um, particularly from the Catholic point of view or nationalist point of view, um, because I saw so little of that community and I heard so little from their voices um, and in the archival record. So over time, as I was seeking to see the people, to hear their voices, to find what resonated for them within the historical record itself during this period between sort of home rule and um, the, the civil rights movement and the early troubles, this project really became about the ways that cultural identity was experienced through a fraught and sometimes beleaguered national identity. So it wasn't either or, it wasn't um, one at the expense of the other, it was both. And both sort of evolved in conversation with each other. And also I think um, in conversation with unionism, um, in conversation in dairy, particularly um, with what might've been kind of understood to be um, also a, a beleaguered or fraught cultural and national identity as the city was so overwhelmingly Catholic and nationalist, a majority by 1850, right? By the time the, the troubles broke out, the, the adult population was more like 65% Catholic and nationalist. So. For the nationalist community in Derry, the outlets for community, civic, political expression were somewhat limited um, before 1920. And they were curtailed fairly extensively through special powers acts, um, even if they were really enforced episodically um, between partition and at least 1969, some would argue until the, you know, into the early 1980s, there was this kind of um, a vacuum in terms of uh, Catholic nationalist voice. And part of that is just simply a fact of history. Nationalists responded to partition by abstaining from participation in political process, right? They abstained, they didn't take their seats in provincial government until 1926. And then again, they, took, they abstained from taking their seats from 1934 um, to 1945. Uh, locally, the London Dairy Corporation found that nationalists um, really didn't participate actively in kind of um, the, the public work of politics, as we understand it, from 1922 until 1931. Um, and I always say, like, you know, they could sort of be forgiven for thinking that it hardly, hardly mattered. I don't know if it was Eamon Phoenix or if it was Brendan Leary, but um, one of them made a point that between um, partition and um, really, I think the, the troubles, probably until Sunnydale, um, the only minority bill that was introduced in Stormont that passed was in, to create a bird sanctuary. So that's great for the birds. Um, but if you're thinking about political efficacy and political voice and feeling as if your community has not only a stake in the future of the Northern state, but also a voice 
in that future, you could, as I say, be forgiven for finding abstention to be kind of the most, um, uh, you know, um, reasonable and, um, and what's the word I'm looking for? Well, the most reasonable um, policy going forward, right? So what happened here though, is that you have silences and you have absences and it's difficult to write histories about absences and silences. And so I started to um, look at memory, right? And I know that memory is a really hot topic in Irish history and Irish historiography. And we can talk about that you know, some other time, or we can talk about it absolutely in the questions and the answers. Um, but I really want to tell you stories about dairy today because that's what's fun for me to talk about right now. So I started to sort of look, um, casting a very wide net to try to understand how the Catholic nationalist community in Derry understood itself, understood its relationship over time, its relationship with um, the communities and towns, many of which they'd come from originally across the border, understand relationships with unionists. Um, and, and so this uh, screen right here tells you some of the sources that I started to kind of parse through um, in an effort to tell a fuller story, to understand it for myself, and eventually then to share it with readers. And as you can see, um, you have a lot of different kinds um, of expressions, a lot of different kinds of voices, not just the politicians, not just the reporters in the, the Dairy Journal. Um, there's lots of ways that understanding who we are and sort of speaking and telling ourselves into being can take form. And they can take form in ways that are really ephemeral, right? They sort of come and go and are gone. Um, they can take form in ways that sort of require a shared space or an audience, songs, stories. Um, they also kind of take, take form in spaces that, um, you know, you can, you can disperse from really quickly. So a procession, a procession disbanded still has the kind of memory with it. Um, so Derry made me think about history and memory, about different kinds of memory, about what is required to keep memory alive and what memory holds space for. Um, and you know, I was, I was saying to someone, it's sort of like we think so much about uh, what memory gets wrong, but we don't necessarily always talk about what memory affords, what memory gets right, what memory opens up for us. So um, I, if any of you used to watch Father Ted, Father Ted and Dougal would sit around talking and Father Ted would always talk about what great crack he had with somebody else, right? And what a brilliant time he had, you know, whatever, before he stole the money from the collection fund. Um, and it was always, you know, there was always this sort of these memories and the memories may have been correct or may have been incorrect, but they certainly told us a lot about what Father Ted thought about his own kind of current situation on Craggy Island and the, the, the fact um, of his um, having been banished, right? It sort of reminds me of friends whose families come from Cuba or Haiti and the stories that they always tell, their parents always talk about the mangoes. The mangoes were always sweeter in Cuba. They, the, the flesh was always plumper. The color was always brighter. It's not about the mango. It was never about the mango. It's about loss, right? It's about missing something. Memory allows for a telling um, that creates and holds space for things that other forms of kind of, um, of recognition may not necessarily hold. And so that's where I kind of entered into this project about memory, was to look at not just the ways in which um, facts were recorded correctly or incorrectly, and not from a perspective that memory might be kind of purposefully um, pointed in the wrong direction, right, in some kind of nefarious way, but rather that memory um, allowed for things that were oblique, 
things that were opaque, things that maybe didn't find voice in more official historical records to stay alive and continue um, to, to hold a space. So this is how I explain it in the book, expressions of memory embedded in speeches, newspaper accounts, travel writings, ghost stories. Um, Shoshana, memorial constructions, oral histories, um, harvesting shamrocks along the banks of a local river in preparation for St. Patrick's Day, or rehearsing Gaelic songs and stories months before an annual fesh, preserving and rebuilding the Green Inn, drawing on obituaries to teach community lessons. All of these acts were ways of drawing on the past to nourish and in some cases nurture a community spirit um, absent of other forms, more, um, more emphatic, more explicit, more publicly recognizable forms of constituting a cultural and a political identity. Um, so it always, I always find it interesting to talk about this book because the acts and expressions of memory, um, they're all like these small dots in a constellation of cultural and political experiences. And when I say small, like I mean small, right? Some of the stuff that I'm going to share with you today, it's like really kind of inconsequential. Um, and sometimes I get a little bit embarrassed about it, right? Like it seems like who cares about the 1912 controversy over the coal fund, right? The heating fund. Um, and, and on its own, it's probably like actually not that important. Um, but thinking about these things as dots in a constellation um, is something that John Berger sort of also talks about when we think about how we tell stories. Um, and he says that the people who first named constellations were in fact storytellers. They would trace an imaginary line between a cluster of stars and then give them an image and an identity. The stars threaded on that line were like events threaded on a narrative. Imagining the constellations didn't change the stars, nor did it change the black emptiness that surrounds them. What it changed was the way people read the night sky. And that's really what I'm going to try to do through the rest of this talk, you know, is just invite you to think about things that seem maybe kind of inconsequential, that seem unrelated chronologically or thematically, but to begin to imagine them as a series of images. And these images, I hope, will be things that you kind of carry with you as you reimagine the, the historical kind of, um, uh, what would we call it? The received wisdom, the official version, the historian's narrative of nationalist communities in Northern Ireland between partition and the civil rights movement. This narrative is one of, um, of political apathy, of grievance, right? Of complaint. This is a, a story about people who sort of stopped trying and stopped caring um, and and again, I've explained to you why that happened, but I also think that if we look at things differently and we look at different things, we might begin to sort of uh, revisit that interpretation. So I promised you a tour. Um, we're gonna take a little tour uh, with words, with stories. We're gonna look at uh, what was called the Catholic Quarter, um, is known to many of you as the Bogside. Um, Bogside uh, famously was de described, Bogside used to be a street, now it's a condition. I think Seamus Dean said that. We'll look at the relationship between Bogside and the city walls. Um, we'll take you to 1951 Derry, where two festivals happened essentially simultaneously. Two festivals that presented different versions of the past, different versions of identity, 
different versions of the city's geography, um, everything from different like languages to different sort of um, gathering spaces. And then finally, um, we're just gonna talk a little bit about a project um, that took place between 1954 and 1958. And those of you who know Irish history will know that those dates overlap and correspond closely um, with the border war, with the IRA's border campaign. And so we'll talk a little bit about memory in relation to the border, particularly the border within Ashoan and Donegal um, that's happening simultaneously as the border campaign is going on. Um, my slide is a little bit wacky here. I wonder if I can fix it so that you can see it. Sorry about that. Let's shrink it a little. So in 1907, um, there was a public health investigation. Um, some of you might have heard of Dr. Bigger. Dr. Bigger uh, initiated an investigation of housing conditions um, in what was then called the Catholic Quarter. So hopefully, can you all see this? Mostly of one story, they're built with stone or brick. No, we, we can't see that yet, uh, Margo. You can? We, we can't. You cannot. Cannot. Sorry. How about now? No? Nope. So weird. Okay. I should have just... How about now? Can you see it just as the slide? No. No, we can't see any screen sharing at the okay. moment. Oh yeah, it's just coming up there now. Yeah, that's it. Great, thank you. How's that? Yeah, okay. we can see that. So, describing the Catholic neighborhood, um, here we have a, a really kind of clear public health sort of inventory or investigation. It's what I would call clinical, right? The houses are one story, they're built of stone and brick. There's not really tenement housing, but the houses are all self-contained. They're old, they're damp, you know, there's no light, there's not a lot of ventilation. Some are situated in narrow lanes with back passages, they're overcrowded, um, they're dirty. Now we're getting into a little bit of editorial commentary, okay. Um, and then we talk about the, the common privy, there's no backyards, um, there's not a lot of privacy, there's not necessarily doors. Um, and so you're getting a sense here of the material conditions of life for many Catholics, not all, Certainly there was a middle class, a, a, a merchant middle class, a professional middle class. Um, but for many people, this was the um, the day-to-day -day material conditions of life. And that's not unusual at all. It's common uh, throughout Ireland, throughout the UK, throughout the world, certainly. And one of the things that's interesting though, is that at the exact same time, um, you have in a guidebook, to the city, uh, a, a, a similar kind of discussion of the bog side, and yet it contains a much more pointed corollary between the physical conditions, the poverty, and the sort of nature, temperament, uh, and attitudes of the people that lived in that neighborhood. A greater contrast there could scarcely be than that afforded by the trim neatness of the part within the walls, right? That's the walled city, the urban core, um, what some would have called kind of the citadel. Um, and the squalid untidiness without. The quarter lying without the walls is commonly called, um, the bog side. And the Roman Catholic population is most, most thickly massed together 
Descending into the hollow, which lies on this side of the city, we pass through the poorest parts of it, streets crooked and disorderly, the houses of the lowest class. It was we found the nationalist quarter and its slovenliness and poverty confirmed the opinion which we had been induced to form. That in Derry, the men who were against an Irish parliament were those who had a stake in the country and the men who were for it were those who had practically none. So here you see a much kind of um, closer correlation between uh, physical living conditions, poverty, um, Catholicism, and nationalism. And none of the sort of um, the progno progno prognostications here are um, particularly warm. So, a few years after this, in 1897, for the first time, Catholic nationalists took seats in the London Dairy Corporation, and they formed, for the first time, a nationalist caucus. And one of the first things that this caucus um, sort of requested or proposed was that there would be a cut in um, from the walled city into the West Ward, essentially um, at like Society Street, right? So there, there was this sense that people could move much more quickly um, through the center of the city if, they, if there was a cutout and there were stairs leading down to the bog side um, and up to, the, up to the walls and then folks could get to work more quickly, they could get to the center of the city more quickly, it would be convenient. And um, the corporation voted it down. They voted it down, sort of arguing that um, it was going to be like a, a cosmetic injury to the walls themselves, right? And this was kind of crazy because there were cut-ins all over the place, right? Um, leading to the fountain for one at Ferry Key Street for another. So there were certainly, there was a precedence here. And so, um, here you see a poem, um, but it's, it's not actually Matt, a poem. Margot, just letting you know your sides that aren't, aren't moving. Let me try that stop so and start I, again. Yeah, just, I, I think just make them, um, yeah, we see that there now, perfect. Okay, so um, this, I wonder if anybody could guess what tune this would have been sung to or what tune it was proposed to have been sung to. Um, I won't sing because God help us all if I start singing, uh, but the song was written to the tune of Old Derry's Walls. And those of you who are familiar with that song know that it's, um, it, it is a song commonly sung uh, during the Apprentice Boys uh, ceremonial marches around uh, the city walls, um, both commemorating the shutting of the gates in December and also um, the breaking of the boom and the relief of Derry in August. And so here we have this song um, written to that tune. So playing with history, right? One of the things I really want to sort of bring out is that there is a, a playfulness and there is um, humor sort of constantly running through a lot of what seems to be even kind of contentious um, stories and memories. Um, and so, you know, this idea that a controversy that's coming up in local city council about enabling pedestrians from the bog side, from this neighborhood that has been sort of um, pathologized as slums have been pathologized uh, by others for hundreds of years, thousands of years um, since the ghettos, obviously. Um, and, and yet they're finding these connections to the political um, contests and the political turmoil that are happening within the city as home rule is gaining ground and as the debates over the future of Ireland and the nat this kind of question of national identity is coming up over and over. Um, and I, I think what you also kind of see here is this idea that progress or change 
that might invite some some more equity, some more equality. Um, this was seen as, you know, not the way forward, um, at least from the nationalist perspective. That's what they were certainly projecting and probably here with some good cause, um, given the slides I showed you earlier um, from the city's unionist community. So. One of the other examples from this period as home rule was heating up was again, um, what I call the coal fund controversy of 1912. Um, this is a really trivial situation ostensibly when Catholic legislators took their seats in municipal government, um, oh, sorry. I just wanted to say one more thing about the um, the song. You know, it's a little ditty, but it's also kind of suggesting that dairy Catholics were tired of being invisible in the city. Um, and they were seeking out opportunities to assert their presence in the city um, in different ways and through different voices. So the coal fund. The coal fund for the poor had been started by local merchants and other business owners in 1855. So imagine this is sort of um, in as the darkest years of the famine um, are over and, you know, the um, the coal fund was a necessity. It was an act of philanthropy. It was administered by a small committee, which often included um, local elected officials. And so the point of the coal fund, obviously, it's just like any heating fund. When you, you know, here we check off our dollar for the good neighbors fund every month to make sure that folks who can't afford um, electricity or heat still have access to it. Um, so this was never considered to be sectarian and never considered to be really anything other than a kind of act of, of Christian goodwill that transcended all sectarian rivalries. Um, so there had been a really cold winter in 1910 and um, the corporation sent out a request for donations and pushed back opening up and giving out money for the fund. Um, and they actually asked that the city corporation, the administration, take over um, the, the running of this fund. And what happened was a furor arose in the Unionist Protestant newspaper, the London Dairy Sentinel. And writers wrote in to encourage a boycott of support for the coal fund. Um, they pronounced that the generosity of Protestants of the city had sort of been used by Catholics who were too poor to procure coal, but in their opinion could burn through money through per pursuits that were considered to be kind of nefarious, like gambling or dancing or other amusements. Um, and they argued that Catholics hadn't really provided a lot of money to the fund itself, leaving Protestants to subscribe for Catholic benefit. Um, and then things got really contentious and this again, remember, this is during a lot of activity around home rule. Um, where the folks who were writing into the paper claimed that Bogside residents stoked their chimneys on the annual commemorations of the shutting of the gates every December to choke loyalists off the walls with the smoke from the very same coal which they, out of the fullness of their hearts, provided. This kept Protestants from, in their terms, celebrating the greatest day in the history of the city. Politics came up directly with one writer saying that since Catholics were so proud to say that they had finally returned a majority to the voting register, right? The sort of the, the demographic uh, majority was starting to tell in the political, um, the, the, de the demographics were showing in the political, um, calculus of the votes, right? The Catholic majority, this what this person said, might celebrate by inaugura inaugurating their own coal fund. They can pay for it themselves. Um, so actually, it's kind of a sad story. The coal fund stopped running 
um, after 1912, at which point local churches and chapels and other charitable groups stepped in to provide um, funding for the coal. So it was sort of moved, you know, from a philanthropic state very briefly to the control of kind of city administration and then back to private. And one is led to believe a more sort of um, kind of sectarianized um, conferral of the funding where Catholics are, you know, supporting um, members of their community and Protestants are supporting their members of their community. Um, and I think it's just an interesting example that in a city where up to that point, public displays of civility um, were so central to the culture of the city, so central, like what it means to be from Derry or from London Derry. Civility, even I would say gentleness, right? A, a, a certain kind of care, um, a, a gesture of concern for others is tantamount um, for anyone living in that city. And so this is where you begin to see the politics of national and sectarian identity um, playing out around the realms of memory with the kind of the, the contested processions um, of the apprentice boys and also sort of playing out around areas of class, religion and politics. Um, Oh, there was that. At the same time, like I can kind of see it happening, right? There's this, there's a little bit of a sense that not everybody, you know, certainly plenty of people had much better things to do. Um, but the, to stoke the, the chimneys a little bit also shows a, a kind of, um, I don't know, a mischief, um, a, a playing with history and memory. Um, that also is, is, again, the kind of thing that gets lost in the historical record. It gets lost when we don't look um, quite so closely through um, the hair roots, as it were, of conflict and cooperation. Um, so here you have this kind of sectarianized, conflict-ridden, um, highly contrasting vision of the bog side, right? What people, what's being projected onto it, how that's being understood and represented within the city writ large. And then you have this other bog side, right? And this is the bog side um, of, this is the bog side of community groups, of organizations, of commemorative groups, of people that get together to learn, to read, to talk. So just up here on the screen, um, I hope that you can see it. But you see sort of, you know, the ways in which memory, commemoration, this relationship with the past, this dance with the past is sort of part of the geography of the neighborhood, right? And so just as you read um, the names here, you know, any student of Irish history knows exactly what kinds of characters, events, um, and sensibilities are sort of being um, drawn upon in this geography of um, the bog side. It was an active place. It was a vibrant place. It was poor. It was dirty. Um, and when I ask folks, you know, does anybody have any photographs of, say, Shamrock Hall? No, of course they don't. Nobody would think to take a picture of it. Um, you know, even if there were cameras around at the time, it cer you certainly wouldn't have been photographing like an old hut, right? A corrugated tin hut, like some of these places were. Um, and so just as it's very clear why they don't sort of live in the archival record, it's also at the same time just as clear that they lived and shaped and helped people create meaning at the time that they were open. Um, and, you know, beyond community organization and community vibrancy, there's also a sense of kind of Irish tradition. And, you know, here's an example um, that I read about with the, what kind of relationship did people in Derry, in the bog side, in this urban neighborhood, um, in, in the 20s and 30s, part of the northern state, what kind of relationship did they have with what would be considered to be traditional Irish um, celebrations 
ways of understanding the past, ways of understanding the changing seasons, ways of linking um, a pre-Catholic pre kind of worldview with one that a Catholicism that accommodated some of those earlier ways of seeing and doing and being. So here's an example of um, a resident from Naylor's Row, and this is a story um, that Phil Cunningham shares, right? So Patty Dean would go out um, for on May Day, on Beltane, um, and gather gorse, right? and would put gorse on the doors of all of his neighbors in the bog side. And at the end of the day, he would take them down and light a big bonfire at the bottom of the street, right? He might've been one of very few people still doing this in the 20s and the 30s. Um, it might not have been a commonly you know, experienced scene, but it was there and people remembered it. And in these ways, even in this urban neighborhood, um, these older traditions, these Irish traditions that really might not have had any place just across town in a different neighborhood um, were still alive, still understood, and still, you know, in their own way, valued, right? Um, and I think that's an important thing to, to think about and understand. So um, I just want to because of all the technological difficulties, which I apologize for, I, I want to um, talk to you a little bit about the dueling festivals in 1951, and then maybe I'll sort of tie in some of my comments about the border war um, corresponding with this investigation of what was called Old Dairy um, into my questions or into the Q&A, just so that we have time um, to, for you to um, ask me questions and for me to answer them. Um, some of you are familiar, I'm sure, with the Festival of Britain in 1951. This was a series of events that really tried to kind of um, articulate what the common denominators were across the empire, right? This post Second World War British Empire was a radically different place. And um, there is a, a real sense that some kind of underlying connections needed to be drawn. In Northern Ireland, of course, the Second World War was a really fraught experience. Um, there was this sort of, um, you know, there was no conscription in the North. There was, there were whispers, of course, of, um, you know, De Valera sort of kind of giving the North back, like, re like offering a sort of, you know, offering Devi United Ireland in exchange for Ireland to, um, instead of pursuing neutrality during the Second World War, to join on the part of the Allies. There was a, a, a growing sort of tension. The, the, the Second World War, I think, was really understood um, in a lot of ways as a real moment of consensus, as a real moment um, of coming together. Certainly, Derry played a huge role in the Battle of the Atlantic. The arrival of the swanky Yankees, the American soldiers, was an important sort of chapter in the city's cultural history as well as in the larger diplomatic history. Um, but at the end of the Second World War, uh, I, I think that there was this, this sense of Northern Ireland needing to affirm and have confirmed its place within the United Kingdom. So in Derry, the festival week for the Festival of Britain was taken incredibly seriously. There was a new um, history commissioned of the Siege of Derry. There were performances. Um, there was just this real sense of um, projecting an image of a Protestant, industrial, homogenous community free of disharmony. Right, um, so the things that were celebrated and highlighted in Derry were the plantation, the siege, um, any Georgian architecture that existed in the city. Belfast was really centralized, so Derry was maybe a little bit less. Um, and 
unionist MPs described Northern Irish participation in the Festival of Britain as an opportunity for Northerners to demonstrate to the world the undaunted courage and patriotism of the British people. Um, so curbs were painted in the Union Jack, Walker's Pillar was floodlit, trees were planted on the mall wall and in the city walls. Um, and so here you have this, this version, this one version of Northern life being celebrated and this one version of a Northern past being celebrated at the exact same time like literally overlapping, um, Gaelic week was celebrated in Derry. So Derry initiated um, a parallel festival to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the organization that was dedicated to fostering the Irish language, Gaelic, um, in Ulster. So the Taoiseach de Valera was invited to come to the city to have um, to launch the festival. Um, it was the first visit that de Valera had made um, since he had snuck over the border in October 1924 to address an audience in St. Columns Hall. Um, he'd been arrested as he had tried to enter the building and he was detained. Um, so he had last spoken in the city during the War of Independence. So this was a really big deal, inviting Dev. Um, and, and one of the things that's really interesting is that De Valera, um, for all that he was Taoiseach, was not granted an audience with the mayor of Derry. And there would be no unionist politicians on hand to welcome him to the city. Um, the attitude probably matched um, the one described in the Ballymena Observer's position that de Valera personified the bomb throwing rabble opposed to everything they are. Um, and so they saw this visit to Ulster as a barefaced provocation. So it was interesting. Um, the visit to Derry kind of sidelined the official London Derry and highlighted the city's Irish history, its Irish population, also its Irish geography. The, choreogra choreogra ugh, the choreography of even the smallest details evoked an Irish citizen citizenry, um, even as it marginalized the official sort of unionist Protestant dairy. Um, Dev crossed the border and entered the city um, from the Bunkrana Road, uh, from the Letterkenny Road. Sorry, not the Bunkrana Road, the Letterkenny Road. Um, the Owen Rowe O'Neill Fife and Drum Band greeted him with a drum roll. Um, along both sides of the road, members of the Derry City Battalion of the old IRA stood at attention wearing their medals. Um, so crazy. And I mean, just because of all the controversy over the Bobby Story funeral and just because of COVID in general, like the thought of like people gathering in procession still just makes me a little like, ah. Um, I don't think I've gathered, other than protests here for Black Lives Matter, I really haven't been around more than like six people in over a year. Yeah, crazy. Anyway, um, the Derry City Battalion of the old IRA sort of were imagined as a personal bodyguard. I don't know if Dev needed one or thought that he did, but anyway, there they were. Um, James Lynch, who'd been, if any of you know Derry's history, he had been involved that year in this altercation because he had tried to fly an Irish tricolor. Um, and what happened was what came to be known as the battle for the flag. Um, he led the procession into the city waving the tricolor. Um, he was joined by Patty Lafferty and Michael O'Donnell. Um, and they were the two men who had helped De Valera escape um, and sneak across the border back in 1924. So the Taoiseach entered the city streets alive with color of spectacular and lavish decorations. Tricolors, streamers, inscriptions marked the route. The main events of the day took place in Brandywell's Celtic Park by staying in the South Ward, avoiding the official city sites like Guildhall Square or Brook Park or the walls. Um, 
Dairy Catholics gave De Valera a welcome uninterrupted and uncomplicated by sectarian tensions. At the same time, the Catholic and nationalist community constructed an alternative political geography, right? A different, an, an Irish dairy um, from the border to the heart of the South Ward with all the pomp and circumstance that they could muster. Um, and I think that it kind of, it offers you, you know, it goes on and on and Dev went on and on and on as he had want to do. Um, but the, the events of the week following the visit, there were Gaelic matches, there were Battle of the Bands, there were performances of plays in Irish, there were arts and crafts, um, there was the focal kind of, kind of like the fesh, right? There were Irish language competitions, poetry, history, conversation. Um, and I think that this connection of, of De Valera's own history with the city of Derry, this connection with um, a kind of Irish geography that sort of laid claim to even kind of a, a different way of entering the city, a different way of knowing the city. Um, these things are tied up, not just with memory of a dairy before the border, and not just of a sort of alternative vision of this, of Catholic nationalist dairy as an Irish city, but they're also tied up again with this notion of wanting to be visible, of wanting to um, stand and have a voice and have that voice be seen and heard regardless of the strictures, the constrictions and the complications of doing that within the state of Northern Ireland that often saw Catholic nationalists as kind of, you know, the term that's often bandied about is as a suspicious minority, right? They're going, they're, they're gonna throw a spanner in the works. They're gonna try to break it. Um, and, and the fact that um, that the the violence, right, that unrest, that a kind of um, e explosive um, manifestation of those things didn't happen until the late 1960s. Um, is something that's kind of rarely ever talked about. And I, I think the way people kind of have come to understand that historically is to say that people didn't really think about these things or care about these things. And it's so obvious from even just this hour that of course they did in myriad ways, in, in so many different kinds of contexts and publicly and privately. Um, and so, you know, again, it's I'm looking forward to questions. I hope you all have some, but I hope that you can see just from this little snippet, um, the ways in which each of these events, each of these voices, each of these moments sort of can be strung together um, like so many stars to form a constellation that might enable us to just invite a different set of questions about this period from um, home rule and partition through to the civil rights movement and um, the troubles. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Margo. That was a fantastic uh, presentation. I have a couple of questions here. Uh, the first one is what are your thoughts on nationalists and dairy and, and their possible sense of loss and a lot of your presentation is about a cultural sense. Uh, what, is, what, what, what around their cultural sense of loss um, and particularly about being abandoned by the free state government in Ireland? Um, has that ever come up in any of your work? Yeah. Certainly, it came up a lot in the archives themselves, right? You have, um, let me just see if I can find the quote. You, it, it, sort of, you have even from, um, even from the moment of 
you know, partition. So I, I don't think, not everybody knows this, there's been some really good work that's been done um, fairly recently. But in 1922, dairy nationalists went really, really, really hard at the um, Boundary Commission, hoping to have at least the west side of the foil, you know, from the foil west, part of the free state. And so Bishop Charles McHugh of the Diocese of Dairy and Raffaut um, sends a letter to John Redmond in 1916 and says, poor Derry, after all it did to secure a parliamentary majority for, for Ulster in favor of home rule, it is to be treated as a castaway. Um, in 1929, there's a 50th um, celebration, 50th year celebration of St. Columns College. And one of the alumni gives the kind of main speech at the banquet um, at this event. And he really kind of spends the whole time talking about, you know, nationalists, Catholic nationalists in the North, sort of like a jilted lover, right? Um, being abandoned or left behind. Um, and certainly I think that there's sort of, especially after 45, um, there's really a sense that the, 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 the idea of the North um, ceases to be relevant or kind of um, problematic in any meaningful way to those folks who are living in um, in air, so in what becomes the republic, right? And so there is this sense of, of, of dissonance that sort of grows from partition onward. But I also think like this, the thing that I didn't get to talk about was this idea of old dairy and the ways that um, the ways that people mourned the kind of a borderless dairy, um, a, a relationship between sort of um, the Green Inn and Burnfoot and the Carrigans and this, the, the ways that those places were part of the imaginative geography of dairy people and the ways in which the border kind of ruptured that. And I, I think the conversation that we're having now about Brexit and this idea of a hard border, um, I, I think people can kind of relate to that because it has been, we've, we've normalized the, the absence of a border. And there, it has changed so radically people's understandings of the Northwest and the relationship between Derry and Inishowen, I think has in so many ways been sort of restored. Um, so I, I think that, you know, folks who know that landscape and know that history probably can get a little bit of a sense just from what things are like now in the context of Brexit and the conversations, um, what it might've felt like for Derry people um, with the with the creation of the border. Thanks, Margot. That's a, a great answer. I have another one here. Um, there's been a lot of political discussion about a, a new shared Ireland, um, and, and probably a move politically away from a united Ireland. What are your thoughts on this in terms of the work you've done in terms of your research on the national community in Derry? You know, I think, first of all, that's a fantastic question. And I think about it from two perspectives. I think it's important to sort of draw a line under history, absolutely. I think it's also important to acknowledge history and to acknowledge um, injustices and inequalities that were part of the past without sort of calcifying with that, them, without kind of holding on to them um, as a, a reason for not moving forward with more imagination and, and more flexibility. And I, I think one of the things that um, I sort of wanted, I, I thought a lot about this book in the context of shared remembering, in the context of a shared Ireland, um, and as I started off saying, I think that the idea of um, nationhood and national identity is not nearly as resonant as it used to be. Um, I also think that there are a lot of people on both sides of the conflict, right? It's not that long ago. And there are a lot of people who went through a lot of pain and struggle. There are folks who sacrificed. Um, and. I, I wonder how you move forward in a shared Ireland 
without a little bit more um, space and breath and air uh, for some of those experiences. Um, so I always say like, you know, in order to have a shared historical consciousness, first you have to share your historical consciousness um, and the, the really like exquisite and um, laudable sort of politesse and, and good manners of Northern people um, I, I think has in some way, you know, shied away from a, a bulk of the population kind of really talking about the ways they understand both the past and the future differently. Um, so it, I don't think, a, um, I'm not one to say, you know, is it going to be a united Ireland? Is it going to be a shared Ireland? I think those words are deeply, deeply loaded. Um, and I, 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 I'm just curious about who gets to be at the table and who is allowed to engage in the conversation about what the terms mean and what it means to sign on to those terms, right? I, I think that we've, we've seen the legacy of um, those people who didn't agree with the Belfast Agreement. Um, and I'd like to see us learn from kind of the lesson um, of what that means when some people feel like they've been left out of the conversation. Thanks, Margot. That's, that's a great answer. Um, and next one up is, uh, how important was the level of Irish immigration to the US in terms of legitimizing the nationalist uh, Irish position? Uh, and we still see the impact of that. We see it in terms of uh, the reaction here in Ireland in terms of Joe Biden's inauguration. So how important was that in terms of what happened up in, in Derry over the last number of years? You know, um, I, I think about this a lot. It's such a good question. I, and, you know, I think like, and maybe I'm wrong, you know, so forgive me if I'm wrong, but my understanding, like my experience of Irish people who've come to the States um, is this sort of, you know, like, oh, my husband calls it shamroguery, right? This like plastic pattiness and this shamroguery and this sort of bullshit Irishness that has absolutely nothing to do with what it means to be Irish today, right? And, and Irish America is this kind of vastly weird place um, of, you know, St. Patrick's Day parades and really very little understanding of anything else and maybe a free bird here and there, the fields of Athen Rye, I don't know. But um, I think about this, of course, from someone who studies memory. And for so many Americans, our Irish connection comes from um, a, 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 a swell of emigration, not during the famine, but after the famine, in the generations after the famine. And so for the, the Ireland that we kind of learned, that we imbibed, whether through our families or through a local AOH uh, or through Irish dance classes or what have you, um, is a kind of Ireland that was held onto in memory by people who really were experiencing the trauma of loss and the trauma of um, a separation that may not have been kind of what they'd wanted, right? But it instead was a kind of necessity. Um, emigration by necessity is not part of the American story. Um, but it was part of the Irish emigration experience. And so, you know, we also kind of, when we got that, we also sort of got this sort of romantic Irish nationalism, right? We, we, we were conveyed um, that Irishness was um, the, like the, the songs and, you know, Four Green Fields and Croppy Lie Down. And so this, this sort of, you know, overly sentimentalized Irish American identity comes from somewhere and it has its relationship and its correspondence with historical time and historical moments. So I absolutely, you know, I think that um, the role of Irish America is complicated and contested. I think we certainly um, have, we certainly provided a fair amount of financial resources through Irish Northern aid. Um, we certainly 
um, legitimized um, the, the plight of the civil rights movement and you know, maybe even um, the provisional IRA. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure about that. Um, but I also think that after the Good Friday Agreement, after George Mitchell, um, you know, while there still may be sort of, you know, some connection that we point towards, I don't, I, I feel like Irish America has ceased to exist as any kind of coherent entity with any voice um, that is really worth listening to. Um, I don't, I mean, people might disagree and I would welcome them to unmute their mics and share what they think. Um, but I, I think between the conflicts in the Catholic Church, the real split in American Catholicism, where some of us, you know, some Catholics are extremely kind of progressive and others um, are sort of more, much more culturally, politically conservative um, and the Irish kind of Catholic split, you know, being right part of that. Um, I think it's really hard to talk about an Irish America in the context of Irish politics today. Uh, thanks so much, Margo. And I've enabled people to unmute themselves. And we have a question in from Christoph Wright. So Christoph, if you want to put that to Margo, we, we can facilitate that now. Yeah, thank you. Um, can you hear me okay? We can, indeed, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I understand um, that the focus, oh, thank you for your talk, by the way, it's been really enjoyable. Um, I know that the focus of the talk is on the nationalist community, but I was wondering, um, the sectarianized geography of Derry today is largely the result of the Troubles. Um, you know, before the 1970s, you had Protestants um, living in the bog side in small numbers in Rosemount, and you had Catholics living on Foyle Road and Abercorn Road in Fountain. And I was just wondering, um, despite the institutionalized difference in terms of things like education and religion, did you find much evidence of common cultural expression between members of both communities, you know, living as neighbors? Did you find much evidence of shared cultural expression? I think, Christoph, that's a great question. And I think that, um, you know, looking at the census data, I, I think that you're right. There's certainly until, um, up until 1920, I mean, I would argue that really you like the period that you would say is a kind of um, one of a, a shared residential um, experiences, at least in small numbers, the numbers were higher until um, June of 1920. After June of 1920, those numbers go down, um, specifically with Protestants leaving um, neighborhoods that were considered to be Catholic. And I think some Protestants stayed in Rosemont, but the numbers were pretty small. I never came across any, um, you know, I, I think this idea of Catholics in the fountain, because the, the area, you know, and again, it's a disappeared geography. We don't, we, it's hard for us to know exactly those lines, right? Like what constituted the fountain and then where's you know, where is kind of Naylor's Row and like where does Bishop Street sort of connect between unionist and, and nationalist Protestant and Catholic communities. I, I think that, you know, some of the cultural expressions just were European, you know, they were the same in Ireland as they, they were in Liverpool or Manchester. Um, the, uh, the everybody, you know, lots of people, people played football or soccer. That was a dairy sort of experience. That was an expression, um, making up songs, playing music, the bands. I think that, you know, which songs they played might've been different, but the kind of music, the kind of performative energy is really, really similar. Um, you know, I, I think that you'll certainly, the, the people that do research on um, the shirt making industry will certainly kind of point to the cultural expressions and shared cultural expressions and shared experiences of women, you know, younger women, um, all the way to sort of moms and even young grandmoms are really kind of, they're, they're fused through the ways in which they experience their lives in the city. So while like schools are different, churches are different, neighborhoods are pretty different, and you have this larger kind of external um, pressure, which it maybe invites people to develop their sense of self and community in opposition, there is also 
a kind of an overlap and and I would say there's also really interesting moments where people come together either in uh, in shared joy or in shared sorrow um, so I you know I, I think again anyone who knows dairy knows that um, it is a gentle place and um, people alike as not find ways to to be together um, and so it's it's one of the things that makes the dissonance kind of so interesting um, is because there are these tensions and these oppositionalities amidst this kind of other cultural resonance um, which is that you you know and maybe I'm essentializing and I apologize but it's like regardless of the foot you kick with you can almost always tell a dairy persons from dairy. Gorbina Margot, thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks, Margot. I have one final question for you, and it's related to your answer in the last one. Uh, what are your thoughts in terms of national commemorations versus unit commemorations and the differences in, in terms of the way they're commemorated and what that means for Derry going forward? Huh. That's an interesting one. Oh, well, I think their histories are really different. You know, I, I, I think that um, there's nationalist commemorations and there's Republican commemorations and they're not the same thing. So let's just be really clear, they're not the same thing, right? Yeah. So if you're talking about an August 15th Lady Day sort of nationalist celebration, um, that, you know, maybe you can compare that to a Lundy Day bonfire Right. So what, you know, part of it to me is like, what is the scale? What is the context? Who is the audience? Who is participating? Um, and, and what is being communicated? So I, I think that Republican demonstrations are militarized and they're militarized for reasons, right? Are they reasons, you know, whether or not I agree with those reasons, I understand those reasons and I understand the fact of a kind of um, the purpose of a paramilitary presence in that state is to also articulate and in, in these contexts to defend the need for an alternative military, right? So there's like, there's like kind of that piece of it, whereas the Orange Order, the Apprentice Boys, you know, at this point, I think everyone can kind of um, see the ways in which this is an attempt at cultural continuity. But in 1900, um, when the Apprentice Boys were marching again um, on the walls of Derry, um, over the bog side, looking down on the bog side residents, I, I think it it was also a kind of um, a, a muscular expression of not just cultural pride but also political power, right? So that's what I, I think. I don't have the answers, but what I do invite people to do is to ask questions, right? To ask questions like, you know. Who's doing it? Why are they doing it? Who are they in conversation with while they're doing it? Um, and what would they say they're doing? And how does that square with sort of a, a broader context that we can see and understand? Um, I, I, I think that everyone sort of familiar with the, the history and the politics knows that it's, it's so much about how we take up space and how we claim space, um, especially in, in public, right? Um, so my sense would be is that if some of these larger questions about um, belonging and laying claim to space are engaged, um, as you've already seen over the last 20 years, some of these tensions um, surrounding processions starts to fade, right? It's like, it's like they're the symptom, not the cause. And so seeing them as the symptom um, may invite a different kind of reckoning. But again, I'm an historian, so don't listen to me. Thanks so much, Margo. And great to have your uh, perspective on this. Um, uh, thanks so much for joining us this evening. It's been a very informative lecture. 
you've dealt with all of our questions extremely well and uh i'd like to uh say thanks a million and uh hopefully we'll have you back for another lecture soon fabulous liam thanks so much and thanks to everyone for coming out tonight coming out virtually that is we appreciate you and we'll see you all again Slán. Slán Gafol. Slán Gafol.